Hi, this is E. David Crawford from the University of Colorado. For the past 18 years, we have held a meeting entitled Future Directions in Urologic Surgery. This meeting focuses on timely topics, and we have state-of-the-art presentations on where we are, and then a discussion about where we should be in the next five to 10 years. Doing a sum up of one of those areas is Dr. Ashley Ross, from Texas Urological Specialist and Dr. Scott Lucia from the University of Colorado in Denver. They will give you the take-home messages about biomarkers from localized prostate cancer. I'm sure you're going to find this interesting and I want to thank them for this great summary. Hello, this is Dr. Ashley Ross from Texas Urology Specialist. On behalf of myself and Dr. Scott Lucia from the University of Colorado, I want to present to you take-home messages regarding biomarkers for localized prostate cancer from the Future Directions in Urology Symposium of 2017. When considering tests for diagnosing prostate cancer, it's important to recognize that PSA has value but is not perfect. There's many tests that have been emerging that have higher specificity for prostate cancer than PSA, and indeed, Currently, additional testing for men with PSA under 10 nanograms per mil should be considered the standard of care prior to biopsy. Prior to initial biopsy, these tests can reduce the number of unnecessary biopsies and reduce the overdiagnosis of low volume, low grade disease. Some of these tests might be even more important in managing the care of a man with an initial negative prostate biopsy but remaining suspicion for prostate cancer based on their PSA. The cost, ability to provide locational information, and the ability of these tests to act independent from each other may drive both utilization and sequencing of these tests. And among the tests we're talking about here are FDA approved tests like percent free or prostate health index or other serum tests like the 4K score, urine based tests such as select MDX, and then imaging and tissue tests that can provide not only information on risk, but also also possibly locational information like multi-parametric MRI or confirm MDX. There's future tests that are being developed like the Epiphany serum-based test. And for more information, a good resource is www.pcmarkers.com, which is constantly being updated. It's important to recognize that the urologist should play a primary and leadership role in determining who to biopsy. And that when a biopsy is performed, it should be performed in the best way possible. This means utilizing information from these previous tests to do, for example, a fusion biopsy or perhaps a mapping biopsy. Once prostate cancer is diagnosed, there are many tests that have emerged that can help stratify prostate cancer risk. Three of these tests are based on RNA expression patterns in the tissue found on biopsy or at radical prostatectomy. These are Oncotype DX Prostate, which provides a GPS score and is run on prostate biopsies to determine whether or not a patient is a candidate for surveillance or not. The Prolaris CCP score, which can be run on biopsy or prostatectomy tissue, and has been uh, developed to look at the whether or not a patient is a, an acceptable candidate for active surveillance. And the Decipher Genomic Classifier or GC score, which has been developed to be run on prostate biopsy or radical prostatectomy tissue, where it can help decision making regarding surveillance, decision making regarding intensity of treatment, and decision making regarding adjuvant and salvage therapies after treatment. Again, for more information, you can visit www.pcmarkers.com. As these tests have emerged, it's important to think about how they can be operationalized into our clinical workflow. In thinking about the different risk states of a man at diagnosis, we can look at how these tests might be utilized. For men with NCCN low or favorable intermediate risk prostate cancer, genomics may be used to qualify men for active surveillance. Evidence suggests that these tests may be useful even in the era of multi-parametric MRI and fusion biopsies where sampling, can be sampling error can be decreased. And this is because it appears that roughly 7% of pure Gleason grade group 1, 3 plus 3 equals 6 prostate cancers, will have high genomic risks. 
And this may be regardless of which test is performed. For example, the GPS score, CCP score, or genomic classifier score. In regards to men with intermediate risk disease, considering treatment, genomic risk assessment, for example, with the Decipher GC score, can help determine the intensity of treatment. And there's emerging data that would suggest that men with higher genomic classifier scores may benefit more from both giving hormonal therapy with their radiation and perhaps extending that course of hormonal therapy with, with the radiation or undergoing treatment with surgical extirpation, including a lymph node dissection. After radical prostatectomy, many men will have adverse pathologic features, having extra prostatic extension or seminal vesicle involvement or positive margins. These men have actually an array of risk states, and it was recognized at the meeting that genomic risk might help stratify which men would benefit the most from adjuvant radiation therapy and which men might safely have early salvage. And additionally, which men would benefit from adjuvant radiation therapy combined with androgen deprivation. And currently that information can be gleaned by performing a decipher test and de deriving a genomic classifier score. At the symposium, we also discussed that predictive biomarkers appear to be emerging. The open platform, de platform design provided by the decipher test, which tests RNA expression genome-wide, even, even when routinely ordered for prognostic risk, has led to the development of genomic signatures that can identify a prostate cancer's molecular subtype, for example, luminal or basal, much as in sudden breast cancer, and we've also seen the emergence of predictive signatures for radiation response and androgen response. While these signatures will need further validation and study, this is a very exciting development for true personalized medicine. Finally, there is the recognition that as more of these tests become available, the pre-analytic, analytic, and post-analytic factors can impact the results, and laboratories will need to look at new quality assurance measurements in the molecular era. Finally, we talked about developments in germline and somatic genetic testing. Urologists need to understand the role of germline testing in prostate cancer. Rather, recent developments by Stand Up to Cancer efforts and others have suggested that men with metastatic prostate cancer have a higher than expected rate of mutation in one of their germline DNA break repair genes. These men not always had a strong family history of prostate cancer, but did tend to have family histories of cancer in general. And these men were not necessarily diagnosed with their cancers at early age. So it was put forth that germline testing of these men may both influence their care, but also allow them to act as sentinels for other family members that might carry germline genetic defects. Indeed, because in high-risk localized prostate cancer, these germline defects may be present up to around 5% of the time, the AUA guidelines have suggested that even for those men, <clears throat> germline genetic testing could be considered. What does this mean for us? It means that as urologists, we'll need to do an, a better job of family history screening, and we'll need to understand the more and more available genetic tests that have come to the market, such as those available through AMBRI, Color, Invitae, and the MyRisk test. We also touched on the fact that somatic genetics and germline genetics might influence treatment. And we talked about relationships of PARP inhibitors to men with BRCA1 or 2 mutations or ATM mutations. We talked about how genetics might influence the metabolism of ADT and its efficacy. And we talked about the rare but important subcategory of men that have microsatellite instability and that might respond highly to immunotherapy. Thank you very much for listening to this summary. It was a fantastic meeting 